Good morning. This article appeared in the Wall Street Journal in 2001 and really raised our attention that the public was beginning to um, pay attention to the potential of uh, vocal cord uh, problems and recurrent laryngeal nerve injury after thyroid surgery. And we became interested in this and, and published a paper in 2002 and presented this in the American Association of Endocrine Surgeons that year and uh, met with some controversy and continues to be controversial, the use of intraoperative nerve monitoring for both the recurrent nerve and the external branch of the superior laryngeal nerve in thyroid and parathyroid surgery. Um, my bias is uh, to use this technology and have used this particular system um, uh, for a, a number of parathyroidectomies and thyroidectomies over the last several years, looking at a number of recurrent and external branch superior laryngeal nerves at risk. Um, just briefly, um, to review some of the laryngeal anatomy, we of course know that the recurrent laryngeal nerve is a motor nerve uh, to the vocal cord musculature, the external branch of the superior laryngeal nerve motor to the cricothyroid muscle. And some interesting anatomic studies have shown the possibility of a communicating branch between this external branch and the recurrent nerve, actually suggesting another motor function potentially for the external, for the external branch. Um, what I'd like to review with you over the next uh, few minutes is to talk about how the recurrent laryngeal nerve approach in thyroid surgery has evolved over the last um, century or so, some of the equipment options that we have, some nerve monitoring data, and whether we can apply some of these techniques that we've learned um, to both video-assisted and uh, robotic techniques. We heard from Dr. Chung about Coker and his Nobel Prize. Interestingly, Coker generally tried to avoid the recurrent laryngeal nerve during thyroid surgery. Um, and it was really believed, even in the time of cryo, that undercovering the recurrent nerve would lead to scar and physiologic severance. And it was actually in the textbooks never to expose the nerve and to always to leave a generous portion of thyroid to cover the nerve. This changed with uh, the uh, studies of Bier and Leahy in Boston, where Leahy's incidence of recurrent laryngeal nerve injury is probably the lowest reported, um, less than half a percent. And he um, quoted back in, in the 30s that routine dissection and demonstration of the recurrent nerve was the best management um, um, of, to prevent recurrent laryngeal nerve injuries. The best management was that of a preventative character. It really did evolve then over the last few decades to sort of two um, techniques that I think continue to persist um, today where some have described uh, a capsular dissection te technique or so-called huggers performing thyroidectomy and ones that would more... Um, uh, meticulously dissect out the recurrent nerve and dissect at the course in its neck, um, a finder, and, and, and I'm, I've been fairly compulsive about finding the nerve low in the neck and tracing it to its insertion in um, thyroidectomy cases and also find the nerve with the nerve monitor in uh, parathyroid surgery. It was interesting in textbooks as late as 1976, um, it was noted that the dissection at no time should be directed at identif identifying and covering the recurrent laryngeal nerve. So I think in any patient that we have with significant thyroid cancers, with large thyroid goiters, any technology that we can potentially apply to help us find the recurrent nerve and potentially an external branch of the superior laryngeal nerve in these patients um, is probably helpful. There are two, two main equipment systems that are mainly available that people use. One is the Neurovision system through RLN. Their new version is called Nirvana and then the NIM Medtronic system, which also a number of centers use. This is a system that I use where a laryngeal surface electrode is attached generally to a 7.5 ET tube. And the nice thing with this system is that your stimulator is actually a dissecting hemostat. Um, and you, one can control the stimulator electrode and the EMG sensitivity electrode um, with the system during the course of dissection and nerve monitoring. This is the NIM Medtronic system. It works basically in a similar way, except that the electrodes are actually built into the endotracheal tube. It doesn't require to you, you to attach it to the surface of a tube, um, but the technology works in a similar fashion. Um, and where this electrode is positioned on the vocal cord, similarly to what the, uh, the Neurovision system is. So this is basically how um, we would set this up with the uh, left lobe of the thyroid retracted medially. Um, one can begin to dissect with this particular heme stimulating hemostat and during the course of dissection actually um, come down on the nerve and, and generate a signal on the recurrent nerve. As you know, there are various anatomic variations that we have to consider. And when I begin on the right side and look low down and don't find a recurrent nerve in its normal position, move quite quickly to try to identify whether there's a non-recurrent nerve 
which by the literature is approximately 1% of uh, the time. This is just an example with the right lobe retracted medially here, um, inability to find a recurrent nerve on the right side, upper parathyroid, and we were able to find a non-recurrent nerve. Um, and it clicks when you're not on the nerve and you'll hear a beeping signal when you're on the nerve. You can see the upper parathyroid and this non-recurrent nerve coming directly from the vagus um, into the larynx. And the absence of ability to identify it lower in the neck, um, I think, uh, makes it mandatory to search because this would be very easy to injure potentially if one didn't make attempt to identify it either with or without the uh, nerve monitor. We can record the EMG signals from these nerves, um, from the recurrent laryngeal nerve, which we can uh, record and include as a part of the chart. Um, this is the NIM system, which works in a similar way to the click and um, beep that we hear from the NIM. We can, if we have mechanical manipulation or irritation of the nerve, a sound can be made just by traction. We can get a train sound. And ultimately, when we stimulate the recurrent nerve, the sound that we like to see that, or hear that we know that we're in the right area and preserving that nerve um, and allow these sound tones to be helpful during the course of thyroidectomy. So the sounds are a little bit different between the two systems, but they both accomplish basically the same thing. The external laryngeal nerve, which has also been a, a nerve of interest in Dr. Anabnet's research, is probably a little bit of an underappreciated nerve in thyroid surgery, um, but uh, may be uh, injured uh, fairly easily when the superior pole vessels are taken. These are pictures from Cernia's paper a number of years ago that looked at the external branch anatomy, where most patients, the external laryngeal nerve comes greater than a centimeter from the upper pole to the cricothyroid, but these 2A and 2B nerves which really come much closer within a centimeter or actually on the upper pole are certainly at risk of injury during ligation and division of the upper pole. And uh, um, monitoring in that area um, is often also called the curtsy nerve. Monitoring potentially in this area and looking for cricothyroid contraction can be helpful to try to prevent injury of that nerve. You can see that type of anatomy is, is somewhat a function of how large the goiter grows as to where that nerve will be in relationship to the thyroid tissue. But when one looks for it, I don't make a habit of digging out. If it's not there, I don't see it. But one, if one looks for it, especially in some of the larger goiters with stimulation, we're able to find it. So directly ligating and dividing the vessels of the upper pole on the thyroid. And I would typically stimulate in this area, trying to see whether potentially that external branch is here and observing for any cricothyroid contraction um, during the course of the superior pole dissection. I found that that has been helpful in preserving some of these nerves. And similarly, we can, uh, we can record EMG signals um, on the external branch of the superior laryngeal nerve as well. Um, one of the challenges with intraoperative nerve monitoring has been false negative and false positive signals, which I think is mainly related and often related to the position of the endotracheal tube, um, which needs to be checked carefully. If the tube is not positioned on the cords, um, you are going to get false positive and negative signals. This is the use of a glide scope, epiglottis anteriorly, the left and right cords, and where we can see clearly with the glide scope the positioning of this laryngeal electrode approximating both the left and right vocal cord. And I found that very helpful, especially with inexperienced anesthesiologists, to make sure that we can tell exactly where um, those electrodes are at the time of, uh, of doing the operation before the surgery. I've also applied this technology as a patient with extensive medullary ca thyroid cancer that required extensive bilateral neck and central neck uh, dissections. Instead of putting the electrodes on the endotracheal tube, we can actually position them back on the trapezius muscle and also use, also use it as a standard nerve stimulator um, to uh, dissect and monitor and identify the recurrent, the spinal accessory nerve through its course during the, the um, performance of a um, modified radical neck dissection. Just to show you, this is that communicating nerve I showed you earlier, which um, I think is interesting. Superior laryngeal nerve, um, communicating nerve going to the recurrent nerve, and when you stain these fibers for acetylcholine, it does actually show that this is a motor nerve, suggesting some other motor innervation from this external branch to the recurrent nerve. Hard to prove that uh, in patients, but um, when one dissects a hemilarynx in a dog, you're able to prove that perhaps there are some other motor fibers that we don't necessarily appreciate. I also use nerve monitoring in, in all of my parathyroid cases. I make a habit that's the, the, to, to find the recurrent nerve in parathyroid cases, and it's, I think this is especially important for the large upper glands which can sneak down um, where nerves on top of these glands can have the appearance of vessels. This was a fairly large recurrent nerve on the surface of this large upper parathyroid gland, which was ultimately 
dissected medially off the gland, but the nerve monitor and a, and a quick scan in that area often calls your attention to something which you might not necessarily expect, expect overlying um, a fairly large upper gland, which we can see on both the uh, left and right sides. So what are the data then for the use of this? This is a study from Mayo, looked at uh, 52 monitored and 59 mon non-monitored operations. Um, there was one permanent injury in both groups. They also had problems with false negatives and false pauses, I believe related most likely to endotracheal tube issues, as I mentioned earlier. They concluded that it was safe, um, but there was really no significant difference um, between groups. Dr. Drala is, uh, is an expert in this technology uh, in Germany and published the largest series, also presented the AAS um, in, in December of 2004. They looked all over the country, actually, at almost 30,000 nerves at risk, where one group had no identification, the second group were visually, and the third group had the addition of, mon uh, the addition of monitoring. They concluded that visual identification still remained the gold standard. There was a low incidence of recurrent laryngeal nerve injury across the whole population, so it was hard to conclude that there were significant contributions of nerve monitoring. However, in their low-volume surgeons, um, less than 45 nerves in their study, they did see um, some small but beneficial effect. And interestingly, probably related to the nerve dissection, there was a transient increase in uh, neuropraxia, um, but that's probably better than a uh, permanent nerve injury. Um, similar study from, from Texas looked at 185 nerves at risk, two nerve injuries. Um, 14 cases where there was non-function of a nerve that looked visually intact. So I think that's the other thing that this technology adds for us is that we can be looking at an anatomically intact nerve, which may not necessarily be a functionally intact nerve, may impact on your decision potentially to perform the contralateral lobectomy at the time of the first operation. So another category of benefit potentially to nerve monitoring. Um, but there were also some um, technical issues um, in this series, and it actually became more common to be their first means of identifying identification of the nerve going forward. So finally then, um, in terms of endos endoscopic and robotic techniques, can we apply these techniques um, both in video-assisted surgery and potentially robotic surgery? And numerous institutions now have, have uh, begun to apply Dr. Mickley's technique of video-assisted thyroidectomy. And um, is there any possibility of using nerve monitoring in these even smaller incisions that we've, than we've been trying to make for thyroidectomy? This is possible. Um, this is a, um, a photo from Dr. Dinigi in Italy. And the, the NIM um, system stimulator, and also the one I showed you from Neurovision through the small incision video assist, one can still get a signal and monitor the recurrent nerve. Um, in that setting. And through the um, scopes and in a video assisted here with the NIM probe, one is able to identify, stimulate, and monitor the recurrent nerve in these um, smaller axis surgeries, video assisted surgeries as well. And thus far, it looks like there's been approximately three reports um, uh, using nerve monitoring and video assisted techniques. Dr. Candiles now in Tulane was our fellow a couple years ago in Baltimore. Um, Dr. Terrace's group in Georgia, um, the Italian group that I just um, mentioned, um, and um, interestingly as well, um, we, we're not going to dwell on it potentially at this meeting, but there have been some notes <coughs> reports of natural orifice attempts to remove the thyroid through the base, the floor of the mouth. This was done in pigs with nerve monitoring and showed that it was effective, and it's also been shown in a cadaver notes model that potentially the thyroid can be removed through the floor of the mouth. Um, um, it, and this shows an example again in the video assisted operations where we can do both direct stimulation on the recurrent nerve but also can st stimulate the vagus nerve um, in the carotid sheath. And Dr. Dinigi has nicely illustrated this here as well. And depends on where we stimulate the recurrent nerve um, during the course of operation. If we have a neuropraxy here and we stimulate here, we're still going to get a signal. Whereas potentially if you evaluated the vagus in that scenario, if your lesion was here, you weren't gonna, you're not going to get a signal. So it depends on where you do that. I, I found the vagal stimulation particularly helpful in a reoperative case where there's dense scarring in the central neck. If I can get a lateral signal, if I know I have a true positive and true negative, that can make the subsequent dissection in a reoperative parathyroidectomy or a central, reoperative central neck dissection potentially easier once I know that I have a true positive on the recurrent nerve. But we can use this, and um, this group in Italy showed that it was feasible and possible to monitor both the recurrent nerve and the external branch. Similar conclusions from the Tulane group that it was technically feasible in video-assisted surgery. 
um, and also from Dr. Terrace um, in Georgia, um, that we could use these nerve monitors also in uh, Michaelis video assisted uh, techniques. Um, so feasible, um, easy, safe, and effective as we've done with our small incision thyroid surgery, but also with the video assisted approaches. Finally, I'll, I'll conclude Dr. Nabnet and Dr. Herrera just to consider the robotic approach to using these technologies. We saw beautiful videos from Dr. Chung potentially with this. What we saw though is from the axilla and from the chest, we're gonna need longer instruments to potentially reach the recurrent nerve if we're going to monitor the recurrent nerve in that area and work with the companies to do that. This is Neurovision's attempt to create a longer instrument um, to get at access via a robotic or a transaxillary approach. And we saw um, the beautiful videos from Dr. Chung, so I'm not going to dwell on this, um, but through this distance that we're going to try to access the thyroid between the sternocleidomastoid muscle heads between the clavicular and the um, sternal head, we need an instrument or a nerve monitor that is going to allow us to get that deep, and currently the ones that we have available through Medtronic and um, and Neurovision haven't allowed us to do that, but this longer one now, potentially, you can see this is in a robotic thyroid. This is um, one of Dr. Candil's cases from Tulane, um, where you can actually get this through the length from the axilla um, to monitor the recurrent nerve um, in that scenario. And similarly, um, we're gonna have to work with the companies to make these devices. This is actually a similar, where you can plug your nerve stimulator into this area, which will also work as a suction device, which can turn on and off to also aid in nerve identification and monitoring during a thyroid operation. Um, I'm gonna have to get used to the idea, potentially, of setting up several cases of thyroidectomies and parathyroidectomies for the day. Um, I think our docking time may be a little longer than what Dr. Chung described. In terms of, uh, we've heard also a, a, word, of, a word of caution, there's um, you know, some potential complications related to bleeding, esophageal complications, nerve complications, potentially traction injuries related to the axilla and brachial plexus, and it's even been suggested that, um, can you go back one slide? Final comments, please. Yeah. Thank you. It's even been suggested that in addition to monitoring recurrent nerves and external branch nerves to prevent some of the radiculopathies from the arm positioning, we may have to keep an eye on the ulnar and radial nerves because some of these patients are having nerve palsies from the positioning. So I'll conclude by saying with nerve monitoring, um, nerve monitoring in the lower neck is not necessarily synonymous um, with, with a meticulous surgical technique, and it remains that meticulous dissection and technique at the ligament of Barry, more than monitoring, identifying the nerve lower in the neck that allows us to perform safe thyroid surgery. And Medtronic states that carefully in their disclaimer that it's not intended to replace the surgeon's medical judgment or knowledge of anatomy, doesn't prevent surgical severance of nerves, and is only a technical aid, and is not going to substitute for our skill, experience, and anatomical knowledge. Um, so thank you, Dr. Navid. I'll close there. Thank you, Dr. Herrera.